And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Martin, who during his near-death experience learned that hell isn't real. Martin, thanks for joining me and welcome. Thanks for having me today. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be able to share my story with uh, your audience. You, I feel like you've done a really good job putting together a diverse community in, in this space. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your compliment. Let's start on the day you died and go from there. All right. Well, a little backstory. Um, I grew up Catholic. Um, so that was uh, a big influence on my belief system uh, going into my near-death experience, which happened when I was around uh, 15 years old. Um, and basically at that time, uh, I had a really rough upbringing uh, already by the time I was 12 years old. I was constantly thinking about suicide. I just wanted to kill myself. Um, and one of the reasons I still didn't pull the trigger is because I was Catholic and they have this fear that if you uh, commit the eternal sin, you will go to hell for eternity because you're rejecting God's gift, so to speak. So it, it was always on the back of my mind. I really wanted to leave this planet. I was having a really difficult time and uh, I didn't feel the confidence to go through with it. Uh, and then one Saturday morning when I was uh, waking up, I saw the sun coming in through my bedroom window and I felt that something was dropped and I could feel that my chest stopped moving and uh, I instinctively knew that I was dying. Um, it's, it's something that I feel like we all know, we just don't realize it because we've all probably been through that experience before. It's not our first incarnation. And when I felt it, I just knew this was my time. And, um, what happened next was I saw a bright light, like people usually explain. And it was pulling me from the chest. Like uh, there was a tether attached to my chest. And I felt like I was being pulled. Um, but people say like they, they see a white tunnel of light. For me, it was a different experience. It felt like it was like a small drinking straw. And my first instinct was, I can't fit into there. There's no way I'm going to fit into that. Uh, but before I could realize what's going on. I was basically sucked through this white light, this straw, and it basically took out all the light energy from my body and left everything was heavy and dense behind. And that's, that's basically what, what, it, what it was like an extraction mechanism. And then the next thing I knew I was floating around in space and I just felt free completely free. All the heaviness from my body was removed. It was like taking off a tight shoe. I just felt like I could breathe again. Um, the, the, the Russian voice that I always had inside my head of just constant thoughts, it was finally gone. And I felt at ease and I was just floating in space. I could see earth below us. Um, I got a picture here, so I'll put it up on the screen. I was just a cloud of energy. Uh, I was this one right here. And I was looking down on earth. And then I noticed up, up to my right was this being, as well as this one. But this one in the back was smaller. Um, but this, this one in the front was bigger and it, they were talking to me. So these beings didn't have any form. They were just like clouds. And, uh, this one started speaking to me. This one was actually silent. He was just like in the back. 
he felt like he, they, the, the, the word I got from them was they're ancients. They're very ancient beings. But this one was like younger in some way. So he was just shadowing. And it felt like they came through a portal. Um, and it's like, I, I think this one might have been also like supporting the portal to keep it open or something. So, so basically there I was floating around in space. Um, just, just finally happy. Like I have, I wasn't happy in a really long time and I just felt like I was, uh, I was feeling satisfaction again. And this being starts communicating to me through telepathy. And uh, he was talking to me in thought blocks. And a thought block is like an instant download of a lot of information. It's not just like information, it's also emotions and memories and um, intentions. It all comes in through one instantaneous download. So this being started communicating with me um, and he, he, he revealed himself as my guide. And this, this guy told me that they've been observing me this whole time. They, they knew everything about me, the, the two of them actually. And they could see that I was in a lot of pain and suffering on, on the planet. And they had, they, they communicated to me that they felt great sympathy for the situation I was going through. So uh, they weren't judging me, they weren't uh, saying, they weren't disappointed that I, I was doing something wrong. They were just uh, feeling great sympathy for all the pain I was going through. And uh, they, they felt so much love for me that they actually wanted to give me the option to leave the planet without having to go through uh, the horrible experience of trying to self-delete yourself. And they wanted, they wanted my suffering to stop, basically. And um, I, 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 I felt like uh, just having that understanding was already um, something important for me. Um, but then they, they kept sharing more information with me that uh, they saw that I was afraid of self-deleting because of hell, this Catholic concept. And they told, they showed me basically unconditional love, like this powerful unconditional love that they have for me. And they showed me how much uh, love they felt for me and just how, how perfect um, they, they saw me and they didn't see any lack in me. And through, through that perspective, I felt like, oh, okay, I see what they're saying. They're trying to tell me hell cannot possibly be real because there isn't anything that you can do that would make you stop being loved by, uh, by God's source and by the collective. And um, just as, as I was floating around there in space, like I felt that love energy in, in, the, in, in the, just in the space surrounding, like it was, like once you leave earth, you naturally tap into that unconditional love. And then these beings were also sort of broadcasting it even stronger than it was just in the space around me. Uh, but basically afterwards, they told me that there is no hell. That's a concept that was created by humans who are disconnected from God's love and that God's unconditional love is so powerful that uh, no one, no one who asks to rejoin with God is rejected. Um, so from that point forward, they asked me, knowing this, do you want to go back to Earth? And uh, that's when I remembered that we've had this interaction before. It's not the first time that throughout my life, when I was younger, maybe seven years old, and then again, 12, we, we've had this discussion before. And uh, every time I was like, wow, this is the most amazing experience in the world. I want to go back 
and tell my family, I want to tell all my friends. I feel like if everybody knew about this truth, it would solve a lot of problems on the planet. But what happened was every time they sent me back, they would take the memory away. They would clear my mind from our interaction so I wouldn't remember it. So I'd be back in my body on Earth, and I would just remember there was something important I wanted to say to, to share with everybody, but all I was feel in my mind is like a blank white light. I wouldn't see the memories anymore. Um, so I told them, I, I, I can't go back again and without knowing the truth. Like, I can't live in the darkness again, the shadow. And I just, uh, I just felt like I needed to know about this unconditional love to, to be able to go back to Earth because I didn't want to live in, uh, in, a, in a place of being confused again. Um, and then besides that, uh, I felt like I wasn't finished with my experience on Earth. There were some things I still wanted to accomplish. Um, but then they also showed me my pre-life memory, pre-incarnation memory. And I remember before I was born, I was looking on planet Earth like from this perspective, and I was actually there with my friends, my uh, spirit friends, basically. We didn't have any form, we were just consciousness. And I remember uh, I was zooming in onto the lives of people on Earth, and I could see how much pain and struggle they're going through. And uh, from a place of empathy, I just felt like I, I, I can go in there, I can incarnate, and I can help people to free themselves from that suffering, from that darkness, from that heavy gravity of, of the physical human experience. So they can realize that joy that they came to the planet to, to have. So I, I remembered, I said to myself, I'm going to incarnate into this planet and I'm not going to forget who I am because that's what always happens. Like whoever incarnates, they always seem to forget uh, their true self, the, the, the fact that there is no death, that life is eternal, our spiritual nature. And so uh, I said, I'm going to go in and I'm going to remember who I was and I'm going to help people to become free from that sense of uh, heaviness that, that always happens when uh, you take the physical experience. And then what happened was I was born and but by the time I was seven, eight, nine years old, I completely, completely forgot who I was and I was, uh, I was ready to leave. Um, so I, I needed constant intervention from my, my guides to keep me there on the planet. Uh, because obviously this is a challenging place to, to, to have an experience. There's uh, a lot of shadow and contrast on this planet. And uh, by the time I was uh, 15, I was just ready to leave. I was really done. Um, so there was a couple of demands I made. Uh, I said, I, I, I'll go back, but I, I don't want to forget who I am. I, I need to keep this memory. You can't take it away from me this time. And then I also said, um, I, I don't want to have to worry about money because money was a huge stress for my family. So they, they seemed to be okay with it. They said, yeah, okay, all right, deal's the deal. Um, and then the next thing I knew, I was back, back in my bed where I was taken out of and we have the full memory of our interaction right there. And I just went to the computer, wrote it all down, so I would never forget it. And then uh, I remember I went downstairs and uh, my sister was home that day. So I, I told her what happened and I finally had this memory that I was wanting to bring back to my family. Like, oh, there's this really important thing that happened I wanted to share. And I finally remembered what it was. And then I showed off my family and it basically uh, worked out that nobody really cares. Uh, and, and not only do people not care, but most people won't even believe you anyway. So <laughs> all, all that time I was thinking I could, you know, uh, I could change the world. I can make, uh, I could do something to make this world a better place. But, but ultimately people uh, need to have their own experiences to come to that realization. And, uh, uh, I sort of let that memory die. I mean, it was always a part of me, an active part of me afterwards, but I wasn't trying to tell anybody about it or to share with the world. Uh, but what happened after my near-death experiences, 
it was just really hard to be back on the planet because I have had this constant memory at the back of my head of this perfection, this unconditional love that exists freely in the universe. And for the majority of my time on the planet, I just don't have access to it. And most of the time, I don't access the intensity that is available. So it was, it was really difficult. Uh, I mean, that, that experience is about 20 years ago from now. And it, it's just been a really difficult 20 years because whenever there's some um, form of resistance in my experience, I, I always have this thought at the back of my head, like, oh, well, maybe I should just leave. So it, it's a really challenging uh, situation to come back to Earth afterwards, after, um, after seeing that unconditional love. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why they wanted to take that memory away from me, because uh, they knew that uh, it's really difficult to be in a physical body knowing what's available on the other side. And um, it's been a process of integration, finding ways to, to balance my energy all these years. Uh, but basically, like, for, for, for the first few years after my DNE, I didn't even know if that was a real experience or not. Um, about five, six years later, I came across the videos uh, and interviews of Dr. Kenneth Ring, who, who's uh, a, a big name in the NDE community, who's done a lot of interviews with people who had near-death experiences. And that's when I finally started to connect the dots that, oh, what I had was actually real. Um, I started to see the, the similarities to other people's NDEs, like the feeling of unconditional love, the desire to stay there, not wanting to come back to Earth. Because um, that, that was a really big decision to make, to come back. It, like once you're surrounded by the unconditional love, it's really difficult to, for whatever reason, to come back to this planet. Even if, you know, uh, even if you have it well here on, on, on the planet and you have stuff going for you, you have a happy family and kids and you want to take care of your family. Even all of that is, when you're in that space, it makes it difficult to say, you know what, uh, I need to go take care of them, you know, because it's so difficult to just separate from that unconditional love that uh, God source has for us. So it's it's always a big decision when somebody has an NDE and they come back and um, and then that integration process after you return into the body to figure out how to live with that feeling of, I know life should be better, but there's difficulties here, there's challenges. Our plan has a lot of challenges that it's going through right now. Uh, so it's difficult to find um, a daily, you know, place of joy or, or happiness when all this contrast and shadow is around us all the time, right? Well, what about the money? So, so that's, <laughs> did you at least get that? I said, yeah, about the money. Least, they, at least did you get that? on that one, oh, so. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have some bones to pick with them when I get back there. <laughs> I mean, o overall, uh, I, like, uh, th there's a lot of changes happening to our global economy right now. Um, I, I feel like we're in the final stages of uh, the, the old systems, and uh, I don't know how much longer these old systems can hold on with all the, with all the breaks that we're seeing in the system today. Um, so... Uh, I, I, I feel like, you know, in the next five to 10 years, we might see a completely different economic system and a, a lot of, a lot better balance and uh, abundance for all, um, especially if, with new technologies that, uh, that, that may come out in the next few years. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a difficult uh, experience for a lot of people on this planet right now. Do you think that you had potential NDEs as a child since you had these previous visitations to the other side? Yeah, I've actually, I had a couple of concussions like when I was growing up <laughs> and uh, there was periods where I was like uh, blocked out for a couple hours after these concussions. So it's quite possible I was revisiting with my, my guides at those times. But uh, I'm not sure if it was necessarily anything I, I, I could recall as an NDE. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the things I, um, one, one of the words I, I attributed to this experience is being recalled. It's like when, when you're being called back 
and you're feeling a tug on the tether in your chest, uh, the word that pops to mind is just recall, like, uh, like you're you're constantly connected to the God source energy. We all have a tether that connects us back to where we come from. And there's just certain points in our life when God source recalls us, and you can't you basically can't say no. You have to go. Um, and one of the experiences I'll talk about in a bit, uh, I had that recall experience as well. Well, since you didn't have a physical injury to your body, do you think then that they just basically pulled you out and had you have a recall? You know what? S since uh, I had that experience, I, I, I thought about it a lot. And w what happens is you'll, you'll have young people and they just mysteriously pass away in their sleep sometimes, right? And a medical example will say it was either uh, aneurysm, brain aneurysm, or a heart attack. Um, so if, if I had decided not to come back, that's probably what it would have presented as. Um, did I, did my body physically die? I'm not sure. I, I know I was separated. Uh, I know I, I went through the tunnel and when I was out floating around in space, I didn't have any form anymore. Like compared to my astral travel experiences, there's usually some sense of form still, but uh, in this particular experience, I didn't feel like I had any any form. I was just uh, a pure consciousness cloud. After this experience, do you think that you had any new abilities that could be considered psychic? My intuition got stronger, and uh, I just I just start to connect the dots. Like th this made me realize that. Uh, when we're sleeping, for example, uh, sometimes the experiences are similar to this uh, experience, this NDE. And that's when I started to look more into astral travel, astral projection, um, because I, I see similarities in those experiences as well. Like the feeling of unconditional love, um, the mind being at ease, not feeling uh, the, the Russian thoughts all the time, just feeling like the natural experience of just existing is satisfying in itself. So you're not needing anything else. Just existing itself is satisfying, which is something uh, in my life in particular, it's, it's hard to find that feeling on earth because of the amount of lack and contrast that I feel on, on a daily basis. Um, and just the uh, components of telepathy, like uh, I'll be in the, in my astral travels, I'll be meeting with other beings, ETs and stuff like that. And we're communicating through telepathy with thought blocks, just like uh, I, I had communication with my uh, with my guides during my NDE. So there's, there's just a lot of overlap, I feel. And the, the more I went into space and uh, make the connections, it, it was just easier to not discredit it. I think that's what happens for a lot of people who didn't have such a clear experience of contrast between the physical and the non-physical. You just don't have anything to compare it to. So once you've had that experience of comparison, it's a lot clearer to see like what's going on around you. Are your astral travel spontaneous or intentional? And if it's the latter, what technique do you use to travel? Yeah, for me, it's, uh, it's just... I go to sleep and I'm somewhere and it happens on its own. I'm not, I know some people do it intentionally ask for projection. Um, it's not something I I've had to do, but I don't, I don't really control it. So I'll just, I'll, I'll go somewhere, but I have no idea how I got there. What pulled me there? I'm, I'm assuming it's my uh, higher self that's orchestrating the, the meetings. It's my frequency and my desire for what I want to experience that's pulling me to places. But uh, I'm not too sure how it all works, I'll be honest. <laughs> Would you say that your astral travels are different from dreams and lucid dreaming? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and that's what, something I, I realized after my MP experiences, that uh, dreaming is like a, a mental processing of like your day. And there's, there's going to be a lot of... Um, abstract concepts, ambiguity, just random things happening with no logical flow to them. 
but uh, the astral realms are more like logical. It's, it's just like you're having a conversation with somebody walking for a space, being able to look around the room, spin around and being conscious and aware of what's going on, having conversations with groups of people, having tasks that you're doing. Um, so like me, I'm not personally a creative person, I'm mostly derivative kind of guy. I work in, uh, in, in engineering, so it's mostly just solving problems, right? So for me to be creating these kind of things on my own, it's just unimaginable to me to uh, be generating stuff like that in dreams. Um, but uh, the, just the idea of uh, the unconditional love, that's, I feel like the strongest indicator that there's something going on that's beyond just a dream. Because that unconditional love, it's, uh, it's like at the source, uh, what, I'm, what I'm finding and discovering is it's at the source of our universe. And it flows to us uh, into this physical realm. And it's the only way to get that unconditional love is to connect with God. And he is the source of that love. And what, what we're doing here on Earth, trying to find it in, um, you know, in activities, in, in, in our careers, in our families. Sure, we can find a, a piece of that here and there, but the, the real love uh, that we're seeking comes from God. And that's the more, I, the more I connect with God, the more I feel his presence every day, uh, the more fulfilled I am, the more satisfied my life experience becomes. Um, and that's not something I've ever felt uh, here on earth, just trying to, you know, uh, follow dreams and passions and stuff like that. Are you still practicing Catholicism? No, and I think um, you know there's there's always good good intentions behind religion. I, I feel um, you know if religion inspires people to act positively and make positive impact in the world, that's that's a good thing. But all too often, religion is used for creating chaos and darkness in the name of um, who, who's right and who's wrong. And I think that's where uh, it just doesn't make sense in, in a lot of aspects. Um, and what, what I prefer for myself is just a direct connection to God. That's something that's available to everyone. God keeps the channel open for us. And we have the free will to determine if we're willing to connect with him or not. But he's not going to force that experience on us. So it's up to us to, on a daily basis, reestablish that connection um, when, when we feel like we're running on empty and we need to come back into alignment. How do you do that? Intentionally. You have to make the intention for it. And um, meditation is a good practice, slowing down your mind, making space in your body, in your, in your mind, breathing techniques, and just trying to slow down. Um, maybe, maybe now is, is a good time to jump into, uh, the other experience I'd like to talk about, because that's, that was actually one of the techniques that uh, I learned there, uh, when I actually got to meet, meet God, God's source. Okay. So what happened was in January of, uh, 2022, January 16th, exactly. I had, uh, another recall event where I was recalled, um, to basically the seventh dimensional layer. <laughs> and that's kind of hard to explain what it is, but uh, the experience started uh, like, I, it, it, to me, it felt like an astral travel experience, but it, I felt again, this pull coming from my chest, the tether was being pulled and I felt that I was being recalled. Uh, and uh, the way my brain interpreted this event when it came back into the body was, I, I saw like I was on the two and a half, like between the second and third dimensional levels of gravity. Like the, that's the best way to des describe it, like conscious gravity, consciousness forms sort of a gravity in a pool. And it seemed like Earth had fallen to the two 
like in in between the second and third, like we aren't even at the third level of gravity. We had actually fallen as a planet because of all the uh, heaviness that's been going on in recent years here. And there was escalators. And I took the escalators up and up and up till I got to the seventh dimensional layer. Uh, but basically what happened was uh, every every time I took the escalators up, uh, I would there would be a level. So from the second, I took it up to third. Then at the third, I was taking it up to the fourth. But uh, leaving the third dimensional level, uh, there was these like little jokers about three feet tall. And uh, I understood that they were there to try and keep spirits from leaving this gravitational field. Uh, they, I, I think they try and make people to reincarnate again on this planet. So as you're trying to leave, they'll try and get you to turn back. So I was, I, I was being recalled, I was being pulled up and uh, told to go. So I was going, just going up these escalators in the astral realms. And this little joker comes by and he tries to make me stop from going. But this call of uh, this recall was so strong, it, it forced me, it pulled me through and told me to keep going. So it got me through that sort of barrier that these jokers try and set up to keep you from leaving. And then when I got up to fourth level, all of that heavy earth gravity was already gone. I didn't feel any more of that. So now you, on the fourth level, I already start to feel this unconditional that I had in my NDE. And all of, uh, all of these jokers and uh, sort of uh, uh, behind the scenes workers of the, our, our physical time space reality were already below. So they don't even come up to fourth level from, from, uh, from the third levels. And it's like once you clear the third and a half level, uh, you're basically uh, free from that gravitational pull. And the, this uh, racing thoughts of planet Earth that, you know, they, they make your mind go crazy, they're gone. So I had this peace and quiet again. And basically, like, uh, as I started going up from the fourth to fifth and fifth to sixth levels, uh, the, um, the feeling of that unconditional love gets stronger. Uh, the gravity gets weaker, so you don't feel that uh, heaviness like you do on Earth. Uh, and that feeling of unconditional love gets stronger. But also, like, the details sort of, like, start disappearing, like, even in the fourth dimension realm, you, like, just because you're not on the planet anymore doesn't mean there's no, no objects or no forms. There's still forms, there's still beings walking around with bodies, what looks like bodies, astral bodies, but not physical bodies. But as you go higher and higher into the, into the dimensional realms, there's less and less details. Suddenly, like, you'll see there's no floor. Like there's no floor. You're just, you're still moving around, but you don't, you don't actually see anything that you're moving around. You're just kind of floating there. And as you get up to like a sixth level, for example, you don't even have legs anymore. Um, so I was being recalled to the seventh level and told to keep going, but uh, I was actually told to stop first at the sixth level because we are supposed to run an exercise. God wanted us to play something out. There was actually, I wasn't just the only one who was recalled, there's tw about 20, 22 of us. And he told us to play a war game. He split us up into two teams. And uh, he, he told us to just play war. And we had guns, we had bullets, we were shooting each other, people were dying. And, and basically every time somebody died, we uh, we just got angry, like, oh, how can you kill one of our own? And then this just kept progressing. The, the longer it went on, just the rage built up. And um, eventually, like, the, the game ended, and uh, we were told to go up to the seventh level. So then we took the escalators up to the last level. And then as we pulled up into the seventh level, we're, we're all thinking, wow, is this heaven? Is this this really feels like heaven. Like if we had to put a word to something that's heaven, we're like, this feels like heaven. And we're all sort of like telepathically speaking with each other. And by this point, none of us had any form anymore. We were just beings of consciousness floating around. And as I looked out into um, the horizon, I just could see below us, it was like a blue 
kind of like a celestial sky with some some clouds maybe and then looking up it was just really bright and sort of like you might see at dawn time like as the sun goes down you see like uh, a glow like a magical glow and it, it felt like that but it was just really bright and there was no source of sun like there's no sun anywhere it's just there's light and um so that's just the first impression i had when i got there and then it felt like we just sat in like two rows beside each other and we're just all wondering what's going on why we're here and, and we're all sort of whispering i don't th this feels too good i want to go back to earth like i want to stay here we're all saying that to ourselves and then the next thing we knew uh, just a giant white portal of light opened up it was uh, a, like a, a big tunnel that was spinning around um, and we just saw this white light spinning around and an angel came through. He was like, uh, I was, I was like up to his hands. So he must've been at least 12, 14 feet tall, but you can't really see his form because he was just glowing with pure white energy. And you can just barely see that he has some appendages, like his, he had arms kind of, cause what he was doing is he was using his arms to stabilize the portal. Um, and then we were trying to communicate with him, but he was, he was like, he was saying, I'm not the main person. I'm not the main reason you're here. Like, don't talk to me. I don't want to be made the focus of your attention. So he was trying to just like, I guess not to communicate with him. And then a moment later, God source came through the portal and his, pre his presence filled the entire space where we were. It felt like a huge pressure just mounted in the space. And we could instantly recognize that energy as just pure, um, as pure, pure love. That's the best way to describe it. But, oh, pure perfection, pure perfection. Something that is just, you, you'll never find here on earth because of the shadow and the contrast. And just the intensity of this energy was just incredible. And um, he revealed to us, he didn't actually come in his full form as God's source, because if he had come in as his, as his full form, he would have completely eradicated all of us with the intensity of his energy. So only a fraction of his energy, like 10% or less came through that portal to meet with us and to, uh, Basically, he wanted to give us a lecture. And we're just feeling like we're buzzing with energy, with love and happiness and satisfaction. And everyone's like, is this God? This is God, right? But he didn't actually label himself, but we recognize through the purity of his energy that this was God's source. And he basically told us, uh, you know, he had us stop on the sixth level before we came up because he wanted to communicate about humanity's um, attraction to war and fighting. And he just wanted to show us how pointless it is, how you cannot ever find a solution in war because it just escalates. And this meeting happened on January 16th, 2022, which was uh, a little over a month before uh, the Russia invaded Ukraine. So it was sort of, uh, something he wanted to tell us that at that point. Um, but, uh, here I, I have a picture I want to put up. Right. So he, he put this image up in our mind's eye, right at the center. And I, I've seen it before. I didn't know what it was called before, but after my, after I returned, uh, I looked it up. This is called the Ouroboro. It's the snake eating its own tail. And uh, he explained to us that uh, suffer. This is like the explanation he gave us for suffering on Earth. It's the consuming yourself. Um, it's it's like the 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 darkness and the light, 
is constantly interacting with itself. And if you're not driven by the light, uh, the darkness is, uh, you're consuming the darkness basically, and you're consuming yourself in the process. Um, and then he took that Ouroboro and he showed us an image of just uh, a man with his hands stretched out. And he, he straightened out the Ouroboro and laid it over the human body with the head at the heart area in the chest and the tail at the feet. And he told us, you don't have to be a victim to the suffering on this planet. You just have to guide uh, your decisions through uh, the light. And uh, like this, uh, I'm not sure what the connection is, this snake that he was showing us, but basically he was saying that the light is, comes from the head and the darkness, the shadow comes from the tail. And when you straighten out that, that uh, Ouroboro, the circle of suffering, and you take control of it, you can lead with just the unconditional love. Uh, and then the snake has no choice but to respond to that. And then in that moment, what he did was he amped up the energy in that space with just his pure love. He just amped it up like a hundredfold. And we all start just vibrating with how strong uh, his love was. And I could feel in my chest, like uh, I could feel the coolness from all of the pain and uh, suffering I had accumulated up to that point. And it all just melted away in his unconditional love. And then he showed us that the snake he had straightened out, it was also buzzing in pure ecstasy. Even its tail, its darkness, its shadow was buzzing in ecstasy. And he wanted to tell us that in the presence of this pure unconditional love, um, even darkness and shadow has no, ch no chance, no hope but to respond to the unconditional love in a positive manner. I, I got a little more on this subject before we got sent back because everyone was, after that experience of just pure love, he's just, uh, we're all like, I don't want to head back to the planet. This is just, it's, it's, too, it's too complicated down there. Um, so he, he just, he said, uh, take this technique with you, this breathing technique where every second breath you'll dedicate to connecting with me. So as you breathe in, you have your life experience. As you breathe out, you give it back to God's source. And you intentionally connect to God's source with every breath out. And he said, uh, when you are feeling like you are overwhelmed with this physical reality and the, the suffering and the pain, use this technique to reconnect to me. And then he sent us back. Does it matter whether you breathe through your nose or through your mouth? Um, I don't think it matters. No. <laughs> I think that the whole idea was intention, using your conscious intention to dedicate a moment in time to connecting with God's source. Um, and just the, the whole idea that it's like a rhythm, that life happens in the rhythm. And... You know, it's not just about uh, praying once a week or once a month, taking a time apart uh, from your you know busy schedule once in some time to connect. Because what happens here on Earth is we're constantly bombarded with influence um, from shadow, from darkness, and this reconnection happen has to happen on a more frequent basis to keep our energy aligned and pure and free of the debris that we've been accumulating uh, from the suffering. And so this, what he was showing us is this rhythm where every second breath becomes a connection to God, especially now as on this planet, the density is picking up and gravity is picking up as uh, these old systems are falling apart. We might need more time to reestablish that connection for outer day, just to be grounded again and to feel like we can handle the energy that's on this planet right now. Can you tell us a little bit more about your ET experiences? Sure. So, um, 
after my NDE, um, I started to have more astral travel experiences and I started keeping a, a journal of my dreams. And I, I, I realized that the more I kept a conscious awareness of what's happening during my sleep, the more I also I'm, I'm aware during uh, my, my sleep phase of um, what's happening. I can collect more details. And that's when I started to realize that I'm not just having random experiences every time I go to sleep, but I'm actually, uh, I'm traveling places and I'm, I'm seeing locations, I'm meeting with people, I'm having conversations. And one of those uh, experiences I had, I, w I was invited as a guest uh, to what I can only describe as a US military ship that's in orbit of planet Earth. It's a large uh, isosceles triangle ship. Um, and I was a guest there of two ET greys, ET grey aliens. Um, and for some reason I wasn't, uh, I wasn't afraid of them. And I, I believe that's because I've had multiple interactions with these greys before, but they, uh, they probably took my memories away. Um, so this picture is, uh, when I first arrived on the ship, I was actually teleported in. And what's interesting about being teleported in is while you're in the teleportation stream, you can actually have awareness of what's around you. So as I came in into the ship, I saw the outside of the ship. I saw the shape being this gigantic isosceles triangle. And the outside of the ship actually has like a stone, rectangular stone overlapping pattern that reminds me of the Aztec pyramids in South America, like a um, dark gray stone. And then the next awareness I had was I was in this room uh, and I saw this giant window. And the space, it was like a lobby of a really big office building. When you enter a building, like they have gigantic ceilings big open space and it had this gigantic window that was looking out into space and I could see the earth clearly in this exactly from this angle like I drew it here. I could see the sun coming in from the side like that and I could see the moon as well. Uh, so the, the, the alignment of these objects is quite interesting and I want to talk about it in a bit but just some more details like this ship it was really dark in this lobby. Like it had these big tiles on the floor that were all like a black marble. The walls had uh, black marble tiles as well. And it was really dark in this space. Um, and then I could also feel there was an atmosphere. Like I could feel a cold breeze. Like the air conditioning was really, really running powerfully because it was a little bit chilly there. And I could actually feel like there was an uh, atmosphere on the ship. So I'm not sure if I was actually there in physical form or an astral body because there are characteristics that made me feel like this could actually be physical. So um, these, these two ET greys are just talking to me for telepathy and we're having an open conversation. And uh, they're actually quite jovial characters. They, they, they're, they like to laugh, they like, they're really positive. Uh, they found me to be quite interesting, so it was really easy to get along with them. But they told me that I'm on this ship because they wanted to show me around the ship today and uh, spend some time with me. And I, they, I, I didn't know what their intentions were, but I didn't feel anything malicious or dark or heavy. And what, what's funny is they actually gave me like a, a, one of those disposable cameras that was popular in the 90s. And they said, uh, we want you to take a lot of pictures today. And I'm like, oh, this is so great, because when I go back, when I show all my family and friends, this, they'll never believe me that I, I met two ET greys. Um, and then when, we, when I spun around away from the window and looked the other way, I just saw this. Uh, so this is the big uh, sort of lobby where I, I dropped in. And it's actually not too accurate because the space was much larger than this. And the people were smaller. Uh, 
But again, if I could see everything was dark, dark marble tiles on the floors and, and, and walls. And I could, and this was like a really busy place in the ship because there's constantly people walking by it. I think in, in the span hours, there are like 10, 12 people walked by and they're always in a rush, rushing to get somewhere. And I saw people in plain clothes walking by who looked like, I don't know, just regular people working some kind of government job. So maybe scientists or engineers or something. And then I also saw uh, military generals in a blue uniform, uh, like you might see, I think, in the Navy. And, uh, you know, they're decorated with uh, their, their stars and, uh, and whatever they have in their arms. You know, I was just, uh, I, I, was, I was just confused, like, where am I? Who are these people? But they're all speaking uh, an American English, like American accent, with an American accent, which I found interesting because at the time I lived in Canada, so I could distinctly see that it's not a Canadian accent. We do have kind of a different accent in Canada. It's not a British accent. So <laughs> that's just one of the characteristics I picked up there. Um, but basically afterwards, uh, the ET Greys, they took me down this hallway and we made our way to the back of the ship because this was the front of the ship. Uh, I think they probably gave me a tour of the whole ship, but they probably wiped my, my mind afterwards because I, um, I kind of remember we looked in the room here and there was like a laboratory with uh, laboratory equipment, metal tables. Uh, and I saw some kind of green creature, which could have been a reptilian or uh, a mantide. Um, but I know we spent a lot of time together that day because uh, I remember asking them, like, we're, like, six hours had passed at some point, and I asked them, like, how's the time work here? And they told me, oh, you're, we're going to have to send you back soon because time here passes one-to-one -one with Earth. So people are going to start to wonder where, where you've gone. Uh, So we, we made our way to the back of the ship and they, they had a shuttle in the docking bay. So there was a docking bay at the back of the ship. And they took me on a shuttle ride. And uh, this, this is sort of what it looked like inside. It was just a small shuttle. There was two seats in the front where they were sitting. And I was sort of in the back. I was fr actually frequently like leaning over their, their seats and trying to get a better look out the windows. Uh, so it's kind of hard for me to draw from that perspective, but um, basically what I wanted to show here is uh, as as we flew out of the back of that ship, uh, we sort of like, we went straight. So the, the sun was located around here. The sun was lo uh, located here. The earth was here. The ship was here. And we went this way out of the back in the shuttle. And we headed in this direction. And that's when we pulled up beside it, beside one of the planets. And I could see, um, I could see this planet coming up on the side here in the side window. And basically like as we were flying in this direction, I could see all the objects in space going backwards away from us until we pulled up to this planet. And the reason they brought me out to this planet was they wanted to show me these space stations that were floating around. So they said, this is Jupiter and there are space stations around Jupiter. And these are human space stations. Um, I don't remember the exact details of what the stations look like. I think they're gray. They had more like docking ports and stuff, but there's several of them. It wasn't just one space station. And then after this experience, we continued just going straight. Like we didn't change directions. We didn't turn. And then I saw the planet go this way. I saw all these celestial objects. I think there's moons and stuff too, asteroids. And they all just went backwards as, as we went forward. And then, so back to this diagram. So our path of trajectory that day was out of the back of the ship, pulling up with the planet on the left side, and then continuing on the same trajectory. And then they, they pulled up beside Saturn. And the entire trip, I think it was maybe like eight minutes flying. 
So they have some kind of warp technology on their shuttlecraft. But they, they, they wanted to show me that there's also space stations around Saturn that are also uh, hum, human owned. Um, so I, I just, uh, I, 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 we took like one final picture in, inside of that shuttle. I'm like, here, let's take, let's take like a selfie. Uh, this was 2004, so even the concept of selfies wasn't that popular back then. But I'm like, okay, let's just lean in. Let's take a picture of all of us. And uh, they, they made goofy faces, goofy, uh, they did like little goofy things with their hands. And then we took a group photo. And they said, all right, so it's been like eight hours now, so we got to send you back because people are going to be looking for you. So um, I'm like, oh, but I get to keep the camera, right? They're like, yeah, yeah, we'll send it back with you. So then the next thing I know, I'm back in bed. Uh, I'm, I'm wide awake. Like, I had my awareness the whole time from transition of being there and then being back in my body. And I just look on the side table. I'm like, where's the camera? They told me the camera's going to come with me. I look underneath the bed. I can't find it anywhere. I'm just, uh, they lied to me. <laughs> they lied to me. I was so certain that they're going to send the camera back with me. So I was, I was really disappointed because I wanted to show everybody the pictures I took. Why do you think they showed you all this stuff? That's a good question. Um, I, I thought about it like years later, and I think I was being interviewed. I, I think they wanted maybe wanted me to work with them in some kind of fashion. And uh, I think I failed the test. I think the camera was a test. They were trying to see if uh, they could trust me with secrets. And I was just, uh, I have a big mouth, so I just want to tell everybody. So they realized that they wouldn't be able to trust me with any secrets. And they decided not to follow up after that. So you think they were testing you to join the secret space program? Quite possibly, yeah. Have you had any further contact with them recently? Um, so after that experience, uh, it was, it was basically radio silence for a while. I didn't hear from them. I didn't have any more interactions, but then, so this was around 2004 and honestly, my dates, like, uh, I'm kind of guessing at the dates, I'm trying to line it up with, uh, experiences, but, uh, it, it's difficult for me to put exact dates on it. Oh, but, uh, one thing I want to uh, say before we go on. So. Uh, this year, I was finally like telling somebody about the story, like uh, recounting this whole U.S. military spaceship and the trajectory and just how I saw the objects flying through the windows, right? And uh, I just, I'm like, wait, what's the, what's the probability that you can just fly straight to Jupiter and then just keep flying straight and you're at Saturn? Like, what's the probability that that seems like it's a rare occurrence, right? So I just looked up, like, when's the last time Saturn and Jupiter were aligned? And I found this news article. This was from 2022 from the BBC. And it just says five planets line up in rare planetary conjunction. And the, this was happening in 2022. And it said the last time this conjunction happened was 2004. So in 2004, Saturn, uh, Jupiter, Mars and Venus and Mercury were all visible from uh, Earth in one direction. But in particular, J Jupiter and Saturn's orbits were very close to, them, to each other. So all this time, like, I wasn't sure like if this was just a astral travel experience that was, you know, sometimes astral travel could be like um, happening in the future in a different timeline, could be a different dimension. Uh, but, but then I found this article and I'm just like, wow, so it could have actually been happening in this physical time space reality. So I, I just found that interesting. And it, I just I just found out about that like uh, this kind of last year. Because I, 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 I don't follow, I don't follow like the planetary orbits. I'm not into astrology or anything like that. I just, I just had this experience and I just forgot about it. I don't really tell people about these experiences. So I'm just like, yeah. Have you ever seen UFOs outside with your naked eye? No, I have not. And that's... Uh, that's really disappointing to me because I hear other people having those experiences. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I want to show one more experience here. After that experience on what seemed like the U.S. military ship, I had this experience. Uh, and, and this was around 2008, so about four years later, somewhere between 2007 and 2008. And I found myself waking up on a metal table in uh, what looked like an E.T. gray saucer, one of the classical saucers. Uh, that people talk about. 
And uh, basically, I was I woke up on the table. I was paralyzed. I felt like my motor motor cortex had been disabled, and they're looking down at me on the table. Um, so it's, it's sort of like this, but the perspective here is a little wrong. I just wanted to get all the elements of uh, elements and locations of what I saw on the ship into the picture. But they were looking down at me and communicating to me through telepathy again. And they're saying, uh, we had to paralyze you because people freak out. If you don't freak out, we can let you move freely. And it, it was weird because I felt like I, I knew these grades well. And like we've met before, I just didn't have the memories. But at this point, I felt like they're my family or something. Uh, they actually felt more like my family than my own actual family on Earth. And I was like, oh, it's you guys again. And I was happy to see them. And I said, yeah, I understand. Like usually when people come onto a ship, they freak out. They, they hit them so they, the greys will paralyze the person so they don't uh, get attacked. So I said, yeah, I'm not going to attack you. I'm happy to be here. In fact, and I, and I asked them, can I stay here? Can I stay here with you? And don't, please don't send me back. Because <laughs> again, I was having a hard time on uh, on planet Earth, and uh, I I felt more uh, more more enjoyment being in their presence than I did in my life on Earth. Um, so basically, I, I asked, "Hey, I'm a little curious curious to see what's going on on your ship. Can I just walk and get up and walk around a bit and see, you know, take a look at your ship?" And so they reactivated my motor cortex i can move again so i got off the table and then after i got off the table i looked around and this is basically what i saw um, in the far left corner well there it's not a corner because it's, it's one big circle in the far left i saw three rows of people humans standing and they're just wearing like white gowns and then no shoes just white gowns and they're all like standing there, but they're all like in a dazed sleep. Their eyes weren't completely closed. They're like half closed, almost like they're drugged or something. And they're just standing there waiting. And from what I understood, waiting to be sent back to Earth. Um, and just overall, the whole ship, it's uh, compared to that US military ship, that was really dark. This one was ex like really bright. Everything was white. The walls, the ceiling, the floors was all white. And actually, the floors and ceiling and um, walls, they all curve together. It's one piece. There, there isn't really seams like I drew here. Um, this is just kind of to show the, the, the kind of outline of the room. But it's all sort of like one piece, and it's really bright. Uh, they have lots of white light everywhere with no, like I looked around, I can't actually see any like light sources. It's just everything was bright. Up. And then in the left, I saw this giant window looking out on Earth, and that's exactly kind of like the size I saw of Earth in that distance. If, if someone's good with, um, you know, uh, measuring objects in space, maybe they can tell you if that's like 20,000 kilometers orbit or what. Um, but basically, um, after that, I moved in this direction to see what was there. Um, So that's this picture. So I came around the corner here, and I saw these two rooms. And, and the entire ship, it's not really that big. It's, it's only like 2,000 square feet. It's sort of like a, maybe a, a good three-bedroom apartment in, in that, that sort of size, like the US military ship. It, was, it felt like it was a community center. Like it was humongous, like almost a, a building sideways. But this, you, this uh, great saucer ship was really small. And when I came here, I, I met this little girl who was actually awake and uh, she started talking to me. She looked like she was about four or five years old. And she was human. And she said hi to me and she says, um, usually the people who come here are asleep and I don't get to talk to anybody. So it's nice that I can talk to you for a change. And uh, she just said, um, she saw me looking around. So she's like, oh, don't look into this room because it's not nice in there. But I looked in there anyways. And what I found was it looked like a morgue of some sort. There was a bunch of dead bodies. And uh, I'm not sure if there's like a pile of bodies on the floor. I just, I remember seeing this one old lady. She was like a senior. 
and she had passed away, but her arms and her legs were in a really like petrified, uncomfortable position. And her face was even like her expression was frozen, like in terror. So it looked like she had passed away, but there was also other dead bodies in this room. And then when I came to look into this room, I saw these floor to ceiling biotubes with adult humans gestating in the biotubes. And uh, there wasn't that many, it was like maybe six tubes in total. Um, but what, what's uh, interesting is that the liquid was green, like like you can see in some, some movies that portray biotubes, like it's a green liquid and I was surprised to see, wow, it's actually just like in the movies. Um, and basically uh, after this point, I turned around back to the tables and I saw these incubation chambers for babies and it, they're sort of shaped like an egg. And uh, one of these incubation chambers had just finished and it, there's a ding sound and then this lid opened on its own. And then I, I, after it opened, the gray came right away. He was like standing over there in the middle with the person on the table, he came. He came to the incubation chamber and picked up the baby right away. And I'm not sure what they do with it afterwards. I'm, I'm guessing they took it to buy chambers or something. Uh, but after this point, uh, they blocked me out again and I didn't see anything else. Um, but a little bit later, uh, I'm not, I'm not even sure like if this was the same experience because I had a memory. This actually came back to me like a couple of years ago. Uh, maybe around two years ago, there's just this period in June, July, where a lot of people were having all of these uh, memories coming back to them about these ET ships. And this is when it came back to me in full details because I had sort of like buried it all these years. Um, but I remember, uh, I also had another memory where we were just like, uh, I woke up and I was standing in a line of people against this wall sort of uh, the first person was standing here and I was like somewhere here and there was a person in front of me, a person behind me. And I remember waking up in this line and I, again, I couldn't move, I was paralyzed. And I, I heard a girl who was standing in front of me and she was uh, whimpering. She was crying, she was uh, full of terror. And uh, she can't even cry because uh, of the paralysis, she can't cry. I, I just, could, I heard her making noises. So I said like, uh, it's okay, we're going to be sent back home soon, you don't have to worry about it, nothing to be afraid of. But when I looked to the side here, there was actually like a taller gray that was very muscular, and he was actually holding a rifle. And he was, uh, he was angry that these two guys had uh, let people wake up, and he was uh, sort of like telepathically screaming at them in anger, like, how can you let these people be awake? What's wrong with you? You're getting sloppy. And then uh, a moment later, uh, I passed out again. They blacked us all out. Um, and I'm guessing they're just sending us back at that point. And uh, they're not supposed to let people wake up or walk around and whatever, but they, for some reason, they let me do that. Martin, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Sure. Um, best way would probably be to reach out to me by email. Uh, my email is shareastraltruth at gmail.com. I also have a website uh, you can go to called shareastraltruth.com. I'm still building it up, but uh, you'll find my contact information there if you want to get in touch with me. So if you have any questions or uh, you just want to, because I, I know a lot of people are having these uh, experiences and and it helps to talk to somebody about them. So if uh, you just want to shoot some ideas off of me, I'm always willing to uh, connect and, and, and lend a listening ear. Do you have anything that you're working on that you want people to know about? Um, no, not really. <laughs> um, I started a book and I just couldn't finish it. I just find that the whole process to, uh, to be too boring. So, And there's already so many people writing books about NDEs and all this. I, I, I really, um, I've never been a book person. Um, but uh, I honestly feel that video and podcast is the best way to get this information out. And I would just encourage people who have had similar experiences, you know, it's, it's difficult 
to, to get in front of the camera and share your experiences, but that's exactly what we need to be doing right now. Um, the, the reality is disclosure is not going to come on its own. It's never going to be something that's given to us as a gift. It's going to be something that has to happen because we use our voice. Each of us has a voice. And as we come together and share our stories, we can put together the puzzle pieces of this bigger image that we're just not going to be able to see on our own. So I, I think it's important that if you've gone through something like this, this is the time to speak up now and share your experiences with the world so we can um, make some monumental changes to the way we're doing things here on, on the planet to make this world a better place. Martin, before we finish up, can you leave us with a positive message? Yeah, I just want people to know that, uh, especially right now, we're going through a lot of challenges here on this planet, and it's unclear what's going to happen next. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed by all the changes and feel like it's a hopeless situation. Uh, but the reality is we're not, we're not going through this alone, and it's not our responsibility as individuals to solve these problems. We have the support of God's source. God's source has not given up on us. Um, I even joked that God's source, look, it would just be easier to end this whole experiment and send everybody home. Uh, but God's source uh, feels this situation is salvageable and uh, hasn't given up and jokes uh, that uh, there's still hope. And um, we have a lot of support. It's not just us here on Earth. We also have, uh, in, in the different realms, we have uh, ancient beings, really, really intelligent beings, um, astral support, uh, spirit guides. Everyone's coming together right now. So it's, it's not something that we have to figure out on our own. There's a lot of support for us. And it's really just about these small actions you can take on a day-to-day -day basis, like speaking up and sharing your voice and um, being there for somebody who, who, needs, uh, who needs an ear or... Um, just somebody to listen to them that day. That's all it really takes to get us for this tough process to get us to the other side right now. Martin, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.